Well, everyone, today is August 21st, 2013, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week, I really, really mean I got a lot to cover, so I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew did not compensate me for this free endorsement, but hey, PepsiCo, let me shout out. All right. This is going to allow me to be on that market like a spider monkey. While we're doing that nonsense, there's a disclaimer screen. Well, it's supposed to be a disclaimer screen. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I could sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Oh, good stuff. All right. Hey, do me a favor. You read the book? You like the book? Then um, put me up a review on Amazon.com. There's a little URL there that will get you there. The uh, reason I ask is um, every now and then somebody will put a review up, which is, has nothing to do with the review. There's one, like a three-star review up there that says the book's a lot of work. And it is a lot of work. And um, I'm sorry, the uh, methodology is a lot of work. And I agree. Um but that's okay. Uh, anything worthwhile is worthwhile doing. I got a laser pointer now. That's cool. That's good to know. Okay. Um, anyway, and these reviews review the reviews. The the I'm okay with the one that's a three star because it's it says like it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. Okay. All right. What do we talk about? Current conditions. Obviously, uh, market kind of went into this uh, what be worry kind of mode where it just went back on to make new highs. We're gonna talk quite a bit about that and the philosophy of a market that just wants to go up. And as I wrote in the column this morning, doing the right thing is hard, shorter term, but longer term, it's a thing to do. You want to be right over time. you never be right um, every time, obviously. We have an update again on a dead money report with a new stock this week and an update on an old one. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the threads to success where you're moving, I'm sorry, where you're combining a combination of the money management and methodology in your mind together to become stronger and stronger and better as a trader. And that'll make a lot more sense. We started that last week. I'm going to get a few questions about volatility and stops. And I want to flesh that out a little bit. Uh, another IPO update this week. And uh, I think that's about it. And we've got a lot to talk about in the market, too. Now, as you know, with the methodology, we come into a market, and we enter that market, okay, when it begins to rally up. We put a stop in. Now, that stop is to withstand the short-term volatility. And I was going through my graphics this morning trying to find the right graphic to put on the website. And one that came up, which was a pretty cool graphic, was um, a car coming around a bend. And you could see the car. You just see the headlights looking forward. And it's, it makes a good analogy with markets. You really can only see so far when it comes to markets. And you can only predict that short term. So we use a short term stop, which hopefully we can ride the short term volatility. Our goal is to be in the market way, way out here. Okay. But if we were shooting for that or trading so we could catch that on every trade, and that was our our only goal and our ult ultimate goal and only goal, then our stop is going to have to be a lot bigger to begin with, and we're going to have to take on a lot more risk, okay? Um, if you notice here, I've got stop versus time in the market. Let's say you want to stay in this market a year, okay? Well, your stop's going to have to be pretty big. Your stop's going to go up quite a bit to ride out a year's worth of moves, okay? This might be, back here might be a one-minute move. This might be a five-minute, 10-minute, 20-minute, okay? And this might be a one-day or whatever, a one-week move, uh, and then a one-month move, et cetera, et cetera. So that's th at time, as time goes out, your stop is going to go up or your stop is going to widen. So the further, let's say you try to capture this kind of move, well, if you're a longer-term trend follower, that's where your stop's going to be going in. 
The problem is we can't see out that far, like your headlights. You can only see so far. But you could get from New York to Los Angeles at night or vice versa, okay? And you could do that because you take it one little bit at a time. It's like, um, who was it, Dr. King, I think, said that uh, you, you, you don't have to see the entire staircase as long as you see the first step. And that makes sense. And the same thing goes with a market. You've got a market that's in a nice little uptrend. You don't know if it's going to continue that uptrend for the next year or two or three, but it sure looks like it's going to do it for a few days. So you go in, you put that stop in fairly tight. You're a swing trader at that point. I'm dubbed the swing trader. My publisher put it in my first titles, the first two books. I took things over afterwards and uh, well sort of at least and then I, and I decided on not to put it in the third uh, title so once the market begins to move in your favor what we could do is we could transition as I often say talk with the little stick figures we go from that little trader man with the trader hat let's see okay once the market begins to move okay and we got that tight stop in here let's say we get some profits out as I often draw, you got the little man with the little trader hat, okay, and then you got the little man with the trend follower hat, okay, longer term trend follower. So we make a transition from this guy to this guy, from trader to trend follower. Okay, almost, and I hate to say it, almost an investor. Okay, because some people say, "Oh, you're way too active for me." It's like, well, wait a minute. Sometimes we'll hold things for years. Okay, you can only predict with any degree of accuracy this, but the real money is obviously in this. Okay, so what we do is we make that transition by allowing our stops to loosen up, often not by doing uh, by not doing anything. Okay. So if this market, once we get to break even, let's say, and we got the partial profit out, and this market continues higher, let's say it goes up X plus 1, well, we might only raise a stop X, okay? And then our stop is opened up by plus 1, whatever that may be. As I said before, sometimes you can play a little game, like the stock goes up 33 cents, and it's let's say it's a... $30 stock. So it's not that huge of a move. It's a volatile stock, too. We're like, eh, so what? Keep the change. It goes up 12 cents the next day. Eh, keep the change, okay? So before you know it, if you're just letting those little quarters and eighths and even um, thirds, and you're not worried about that little bit of a minuscule stop raise. Before you know it, you've let that stop open up by a point or so. Now, if you're fortunate and you get like a three-point jump or something one day, then you might say, well, let me just bump it up one point. And now your stop overnight has opened up two points. Now, you've got to see it as gaining ground, as I've said quite a bit. And let me flesh that out real quick. I didn't mean to go on such a tangent on this, but I think it's important to build the case. So let's say you did get that swing trade stop up really quick, and it's going to stair step up, and you got your partial profits, and now you're nicely above break even, and this market's beginning to move. Well, let's say this market begins to accelerate higher, goes three points higher. You can't monetize this three points and say, ooh, it's, I'm going to go buy a car with this profit or whatever the case may be. But what you can do is you can say, well, I know I need to bump my stop up a little bit, so let me bump my stop up one point plus one. And if you focus on this as gaining ground and not so much on this, so focus on the stop if stopped out if you must monetize things. Now try not to monetize things because that's going to make it tough for you to stay in the market and you've got to capture the occasional outlier to make the methodology really work, okay? It'll work in good market conditions on a swing trade basis and a partial profit basis, but it works so much better 
when you're capturing those longer term gains. So try not to monetize these open profits here. Now, I kind of digress a little bit, but my point is that the longer you're going to be in the market, especially if you're doing this from the get-go, the longer you're going to be in the market, the bigger that stop is going to have to be. Now, if you do things properly, and I had a really good example a while back. I couldn't find it. I was digging through my charts. And that's the beauty of having all of these shows that I do. How many times do I have to tell you I do a show every Thursday? <laughs> anyway. But in doing all these shows, I've got so much material out there. And it, it's so much that I can't even find it when it comes to doing a new show. And probably what I should do is, I, now that I'm thinking out loud, I should probably make a note of this, I should just go in and look at the index for all the different chart shows I've done over the years, and then I would know exactly where to find it. So that's a good idea. So just to kind of pat myself on the back, there's a lot of good information in those flash drives and these shows that comes up each week. And a lot of that stuff, you are part of the show, and you actually make the show better. So uh, congratulate yourself, too. But we did talk about this quite a bit a while back, and I had a really good example. But this one's not too bad. And what I did here to, to, prove the, to show the point was I decreased. This is normally I would look at a 50-day HV. And normally I don't plot it out. Very rarely do I actually plot it out. Years ago, I did a lot of research in volatility. I was becoming fascinated with volatility. And if you'd asked me 15 or so years ago where you think I'd be today, I think I'd, I'd be probably 50-50 volatility kind of guy slash trade kind of guy or, or maybe even more volatility because I was so fascinated with it. I did a whole lot of work. Uh, in volatility, but I got back to focusing on trend um, pretty much exclusively. But all that I learned in volatility really did help quite a bit. So I would encourage you to study volatility. And there's some anomalies here and there of volatility. We won't get into those today. But for the most part, know that if the price is increasing at an accelerating rate, what is what we're looking for, okay? Then we know that the volatility is also going to increase. So I don't know if I close the loop on this. This is actually a 25-day volatility because this is a uh, new issue. So I, I went with a, a shorter-term volatility to show you what's going on. So we want to capture two things. We want to capture a trend, but we also want to capture an accelerated trend. And an easy way to put that is you want to make as much money as fast as possible. And you options people out there, it's real easy for you and you to understand because you are long volatility. Well, if you are trading, okay, short a stock or long a stock, in reality, you, you sort of are long volatility, too, because you want that volatility to expand in the direction of the trend. And the two kind of go hand in hand. So you can see that this market was kind of poking along in here. And then what happened? It gapped higher. And you can see this is a reflected in volatility, kind of flatlined a little bit. Now, remember, this is a pretty short volatility. So changes, little changes are going to be reflected pretty quick. But this isn't that big of a drop. It's only two points. Okay, it went from 40 down to 38. And then you can see that as the trend began to resume and accelerate higher, so we could get up to those partial profit targets, this market began to take off, so did the volatility. So if done properly, volatility is going to increase with price. So this is part of the letting that stop open up with time. So I was getting quite a few questions about this, or actually one or two, uh, about volatility and price. So keep in mind, if you do it right, and volatility will increase in price. Now, one of the anomalies is 
if a market does just kind of crawl higher like it did here in a persistent way, then the volatility will drop off. Okay, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about this initial jump in volatility. So even though volatility dropped off here, notice that it's up here now and it was down here before the move. So it made a pretty big jump or a fairly sizable jump, I should say, before the move. This is going to be a little bit uh, over exacerbated, if that's a word, because it is a shorter term volatility. I like usually a 50 day volatility. So the widening of the stop helps to capture the longer term trend because the longer the time frame as we're making that transition from trader to trend follower or dare I say investor, the bigger the stop is going to have to be. And what also goes with that is the expansion and volatility, which if done properly, we will also capture. Frenchy says, what about market structure? What, um, I'm not talking about, uh, I'm, I don't know what, you, what you're saying or what you're asking. You want to get? You want to talk about the market? We'll get to the market in a minute. Is that what you're saying? Or volatility combined with market structure, volatility overall market? Anything related to volatility you're looking for? Okay. While we're waiting on Frenchy, um, let's have a dead money report. Today's dead money report, as always, is brought to you by www.trendfollowingmoron.com. Go there now. No, go there after the webinar. Don't go there now. Well, Investopedia says dead money is a slang term for money invested in security with minor hopes of appreciation and returning a return. Okay. The problem is we don't know that it has minor hopes of appreciation or earning a return. We don't know that. Let's say you get the stock and it rallies up a little bit, just kind of goes sideways, okay? Well, that's not necessarily dead money. How do you know that stock is not going to get bought out? How do you know it's not just resting? Making that base so it could go to what? Space, okay? You don't. So what do you do? You honor your little stop. And if you get stopped out, yep, it was dead money. Check that off, okay? But there's no need to exit a position as long as a stop is not hit. Hey, David, your first book you wrote, When in Doubt, Get Out. I did. And we were in the rip Rory bull market of 1999 when that book was being written. So getting out of a position that wasn't going up 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% a day, 100% a day was usually the thing to do. At one point, it got so darn crazy. I remember, and I was doing all kind of, I was just trading like a madman back then. But I remember having a sort done, a real-time sort. And as part of my strategy was to always be, I pick up some, I'd pick some big winners that I liked or, or I'd look for, like, what big gains in a day or whatever. But I would just stay in, like, the top two or three gainers all day long as part of my strategy. And that's how crazy it was where you could just have simple things like just stay, uh, like, a real-time relative strength where you had, let's say you had one, two, three, four. Let's say you had ten securities, okay? Well, you just stay at these three. And every time a new one would come in and one would drop out, you would just exit that. Um, if there was nothing else going on during the day, I would do that. And that worked out. It was amazing. Because some of these, they were already up five points and they go up ten points. It was ridiculous. We're not in that kind of a market. So when I did a little follow-up on the books, which you, you if you get the e-book, I've got a follow-up on the e-books. And if you don't, if you already bought the hardcovers, God bless you for for being around so long. Uh, just email me, and I'll shoot you those intro, the the new intro to the books, which is um, for the first two books. And basically, I said that uh, how I cha how I've changed with the markets, and it's basically just a bunch of little small tweaks. 
it's not that big of a deal. We're using a little bit wider stops now. We're using a little bit more liberal, liberal entries. And we are sticking with positions, good, bad, or indifferent, as opposed to when in doubt, get out. But other than that, not much has changed, okay? And I outlined that. If you want that PDF, just shoot me an email. Definition of investor, or is it a repeat of an old expression? Hold them if they are going up. Don't if they're not. Well, that's not an investor. That's a trader. Uh, that's why I hate to use the word investor. Investor makes it sound like you get in and you're good, bad, and indifferent. You know, I mean, I've talked with people. I was talking with someone last night. It's like, uh, you know, they held the stock from 15 to 5. And, and you know, and, and I, I know some people that held stocks through 50% drops and, and more. And then they come back, and it's like, they ah, I made all this money, made a lot of money on this stock. I'm like, yeah, but you lost half your money. And how did you know that it wasn't going to come back after you lost half or 70% or 80% of your money, whatever the case may be? So that's why we use a stop, okay? Now, Fritchie says, uh, time, volume, open interest, price. Uh, don't use open interest. Don't use volume. Um Time is, is going to be short term. So the time is going to be the same on all trades. We're going to look at the first, look at the last couple of weeks or so and figure out where that stop needs to be. So getting back to the dead money, we did have a little nice little move again over the last week or so at Zen. And Zen, as you can see, was kind of dead money for quite a long time. But if you measure it out over 52 days, once again, now it's 240% annualized. It was like 100% annualized when we first hit the profit target. Since this market has continued to run, this stock, now it's 240% annualized. Now, we had a new one hit the profit target today. And it took 39 days. Well, you could argue... This thing's just meandering around. Why stick with it? Well, stick with it until proven wrong. How are you proven wrong? Well, you stopped out. You stopped out. So that's 92% annualized. Rallies up a little bit more. I'd be 100% or so. So not bad. Better than a poke in the eye. One thing on this stock, which is kind of cool, is, and I've done lectures on this before, so I don't want to get into it too much, but... Um, price versus time, okay, is something you need to think about when you are doing that initial trade. And let's say you got a profit target right here and the market comes up to like right there. That's kind of a no-brainer. You want to take that profit target, okay? So you could see that our profit target was here. And it wasn't like a smidge below it. Let's see if we can get this drawn in a little bit better. It wasn't a, I can't draw a straight line, it saved my life. It wasn't a smidge below it, let's just do this, okay? Let's see, it was about right there, okay. So you can see it didn't get quite up to there. It didn't get to like a cent or two or even 25 cent within the profit target. But you had an entry here, and let's count the day we enter as day one, two, three. This is the third day, this is day three. And because the price versus time moves so fast, okay, it's almost like it got ahead of itself. It's okay to take partial profits when you're a little close like that because if a market goes straight up, if you're fortunate enough, when I say market, I mean stock or whatever the case may be, then it's okay to take profits a little bit early. Now, don't throw caution to the wind, but if you're within, it's a $30 stock, you're with a half a point or so, maybe even three quarters of a point. Let's say you're looking for five points which I forget what we're looking for in this. We'll take a look at it in one minute. Then if you're up four to quarter, four and a half, that's okay. You can take profits a little bit early. Now, there's always a trade-off in that there is a chance, obviously, you'll get stopped out if you bump that stop up too much out of taking profits. But sometimes don't look a gift horse in the mouth. I'm not going to read all this to you because we've talked about this the last couple of weeks. Just remember that the market is the final arbiter. Don't try to outsmart it. Let the stop take you out. You're going to be amazed at how many times just honoring your stop is the thing to do and stop thinking so much about the market. If you have time to think about the markets, 
then I would strongly urge you, instead of looking at your positions all day and watching every little tick and making yourself crazy and ruining your eyesight, then I would urge you to do a little research, okay? Or do something to get your head on straight. Take a walk around the block. But if you feel like you must stare at the market, then do a little research. Take a look at some IPOs. Take a look at some sectors. Take a look at some moving averages with longer-term trends. Study some daylight. Go back and study longer-term markets, okay? Study tops. Study bottoms. Notice that, and part of this is I learned from Greg, a market doesn't just ring a bell and stop one, uh, top one day, and that's it. Usually it has a couple of sell-offs and rollovers and sharp thrusts down first, and then it, it begins to implode. And that's a good thing. That's something that you can learn empirically by going in and looking at the markets. And, and, you get to, and that's something that's wonderful. Hopefully it will always be that way in that you don't just have one day and bam, that's it. But usually at tops, you usually have some sort of warning signs. Things begin to crack a little bit. Things begin to deteriorate, okay? And when they do begin to deteriorate, if you have a stop in place and things begin to come unglued a little bit, then more likely than not, you will get stopped out. So let's say they deteriorate and then bam, market begins to crash. You're going to already be stopped out. Okay, so this kind of dovetails in by complete accident into the next thing I want to talk about. I want to talk about doing the right thing. Oh, Frenchie was saying something about volume and some other things. I don't use open interest. I don't use volume. And basically I use price. That's about it. Occasionally a moving average. And I've done a few lectures just on price and being the uh, ultimate arbiter. Now, let's talk about doing the right thing by honoring that stop. So let's say you do get a market that looks like this, which it will almost 99% before it tops. It might look like this. Okay. So you get a market that begins looking like that. Well, what's going to happen is there's a pretty good chance that your stock did the same thing and your stop, S-T-O-P, hopefully you were trailing higher for a long time, will take you out of the market. So, bam, you just get out of the position. You stopped out, you stopped out. Now, when you do see a market begin to roll over like this, in this case, let's say it's making bow ties, in this case, first thrust, okay, then what do you do? Well, you start shorting individual issues. You might even, if you can't find anything that you're super excited about, you might short the overall market. Now, keep in mind that it's harder to play the overall market and catch a big move and just harder in general than it is to play individual issues and find that next, uh, that find a stock that's going to make a more inefficient move than the overall market, meaning that the market might just go down 3 or 4%. But the stock could, could lose 20%, 30% of its value very easily. Okay, So when that market does begin to roll over again on your individual issue basis, start honoring your stops, and then start putting shorts on. Okay, If you look at the YouTube I have out there, and it's something I, I was hesitant to do, but I put it out anyway uh, just because I was kind of pressured. Uh, I put out what I call a discretionary portfolio based on the service. And we've talked about this before, but you'll see that, this, let's say this is the market. The market begins to tank, and you'll see the service equity curve looks just like the market. Okay? But if the market keeps tanking, what happens? The service equity curve flattens out a little bit, and then eventually it starts going up. So you have this nice divergent behavior. Now, we're looking back over 10 years if you look at the results uh, and it's all hypothetical and educational. Let's put the disclaimers in there, right? But you can download the raw data if you want and, and look at it yourself, and I would encourage you to do that. Anyway, but the point I'm trying to make is this is your equity, which if you are a good little trend follower, what do we have here? We have an up arrow. So you're trend following, and as long as that trend continues, you're going to make money. But what happens when the market rolls over? 
okay? Well, you just start losing money because, bam, you get stopped out, bam, you get stopped out. And then if that trend continues lower, well, you start getting shorts, and then all of a sudden you start coming out of that drawdown, and you actually make money when the market goes down, okay? It's not my favorite thing to do. Shorting is a necessary evil. It's not the greatest thing in the world. I hate the short covering rallies. It could be a pain in the butt, but it's the right thing to do. Now, what has this market done since 2009? Bam, rolls over, goes back up. Rolls over, goes back up, okay? And some of these rollovers aren't just like a little pullback. It's not like it's a little stair step, nice little pullbacks, which would be wonderful. It has made bona fide rollovers, bona fide by sell signals, bona fide by price movement, okay? Some of those corrections have been substantial enough to suggest that the trend has ended. Now, if you just buy and hope and close your eyes, okay, losing tons of money, but you're never really losing it, right? Because it's a paper loss. Okay, I'm being a little facetious there. Then you did the right thing by staying with the market. Well, that's not the right thing. The right thing to do is to get stopped out here, to put on shorts here, even though that market has a chance of going back up. Now, you could argue, and this is where you get in a lot of trouble, but you could argue that it's the Fed that's doing this every time the market drops. Well, maybe it is, okay? And they probably had a big thing to do with it. But so what? What difference does it make? Market goes up, the market goes up. So again, and as I said quite a bit, I think that uh, quoting, uh, I think his name is Dotery, Judd Dotery from uh, Greg Morris's book, Invest with the Trend, um, he basically said anyone who from 2009 has outperformed the market uh, should be questioned, talking about active manager, because not because they they didn't take the proper action when the market began to roll over. Now, one thing that I think can happen, and we'll probably talk about this quite a bit, but the S&P is kind of looking like this. One thing I think can happen, if we start banging on new highs decisively, even though we're overbought here, which we'll talk about that in a few minutes. I think that eventually the people who have been sitting on their hands, some of which maybe for 2009, because what happened in 2008? Market lost over half its value, recovered a little bit, but by the end of the year it was down 40%, okay? So people who lost about half of their money, round numbers, and that's probably a, a conservative estimate, who rolled it down in 2008, when that bottom hit in 2009, they didn't rush out and buy it, even though we had some signals that started uh, in March, I think, of 2009, if memory serves. We had quite a few big winners in. So they're sitting around saying, holy moly, this market is up here. And that's not the scale. This market is up here making new highs again. I better do something. So I think they could get rushed in or forced in. Performance anxiety could kick in. And and that could exacerbate the bubble or, or could create a bubble, I should say. And that's okay, okay? Uh, but now, getting back to this before I digress too far, just remember it's never different this time, okay? So there's going to be some compelling arguments, especially now since we're in one of the longest runs in history. And by the way, that's another thing you can go back and do. Instead of watching every little frickin' tick, okay, Go back in and see how long major legs have lasted. And I haven't done the math, but I read somewhere, I heard somewhere, we're definitely in one of the longest, if not the longest, because it's, what, 2009? It's five years, going on six years, okay? That's a long time for a market to go up, especially the, the rate that it has, okay? But it's never different this time. It might last a little longer or go a little further, but there's not going to be some sort of massive change in how markets work or whatever that's going to push that market up forever. So you've got to do the right thing. And like uh, I wrote in a column this morning quoting Greg, you're not going to always be right, but it's important to be right over time. And do the right thing over time. So again, 
when that market does begin to roll over, and you get a, let's say you get a bow tie down or you get a first thrust or whatever, then you need to say, okay, I'm going to let my longs get stopped out. I'm not going to be too aggressive on the long side unless the issue could trade contra or issues could trade contra to the overall market. And unless I have some pretty good looking stocks that I think could just go up no matter what. Okay. So you get stopped out, you put some shorts on and Hey, if it doesn't work out, so what? That's the right thing to do. So sometimes psychologically it could be really tough doing the right thing even though the right thing is what you need to be doing even though you could lose money I should say not the right thing but even though you could lose money doing the right thing last week I introduced the concept of psychology money management and the methodology being all kind of interwoven to your success and this came from I did a um, it, it's it's pretty much with a little bit added in, but it was pretty much the IPO introduction webinar that I did to get everybody up to speed on the methodology. Dave Landry 101, the approach, approach to the market, trend following 101, arrows and everything, right? Uh, it's pretty much that intro webinar that I did for the IPO webinar. And when I started parsing it out, I began to, to, to think, wow, this, the pieces of this are better than the whole, especially once I put the transitions in from one part to the next. And somehow in that process, I got to thinking about it. I'm not sure exactly how it all came about. I think I was, I was doing the, um, uh, talking about, I started thinking about the three pillars of success when it comes to trading. And that psychology and money management and the methodology. And then also I talked about it being really more of a, I don't know how to draw a stool in 3D, but uh, really being more like a three-legged stool, whereas if any one of these legs falls, the whole stool, stool, the whole stool, I sound like, steward, what are you doing here? I took the 435 to the, to the loop. I don't know if you ever get to see the Californians, but I... Uh, Digress. But anyway, the stool would fall over if one of those legs uh, would collapse. So I got to thinking about it and got a little bit more philosophical, and I kind of started thinking about it as a rope, where these are the three strands of the rope. And where I went a little further with that is I began to think that if you improve on just any one strand of that rope, one little tiny strand. The whole rope is going to get stronger, so your success is going to get better because you've got let's that one little strand running all the way through here. But what's kind of cool is is that the other two, the psychology and the methodology actually improve. And let me show you how that's going to work. Let's say you ride out a big winner, okay? Suppose you're a micromanager. And every time a stock goes up two points, you take a profit. And you feel pretty good doing that. And you're in kind of a choppy market. And you're making money doing that. And then you get a stock that goes up 10 points. Okay. So you miss that extra eight points. Or a stock goes up 20 or 30 or even 50 points. Okay. And you got two points out of those 50 points. So you miss the big picture. You miss that big gain. But let's say you're willing to put aside your micromanagement days and you're going to follow the market along and you're going to allow your stop to get stopped out. So you end up riding out, number one, a big winner. Okay. So if you ride out a big winner, your money in position management has become stronger because you've got this thread here, which now gets added into the rope, so to speak. And if you ride out a big winner, you just improve your chances of sticking with the plan. You're like, oh, well, wait a minute. Now I get it, okay? So now I'm going to be more likely to ride out a winner. And also, because you wrote out that winner, you now have automatically become better at identifying winners. So one, two, and three. Now we have one, two, three things that are going to make 
your success even better. Okay, make it make the rope stronger, so to speak. Now, guess what? If you're better at identifying winners, then you're going to have more winners to ride out, and then you're going to ride out another winner, which is going to make you even better at identifying winners, which is going to make it even easier to follow the plan, which is going to make it easier to allow the money management to run its course, which you will then get better at letting things stop out because you'll say, well, maybe this one was not going to turn into a big winner. So I think it's kind of neat, and sometimes I get a little too philosophical, and I realize that, especially when things improve a little. And don't get me wrong, I still get bummed out, but the more and more experience that I that I have or acquire, the, the better I am at understanding the process, and the next time the drawdown comes along, now I ask me when I'm kind of bummed out, you know, uh, in the middle of a drawdown, see if I'm still so philosophical. But in general, each subsequent drawdown becomes a little bit easier for me because I know that, hey, wait a minute, nothing's really working now. I need to back off a little bit, and we might have to go flat for a while. I might end up in cash for a while, and there's nothing wrong with that. But each time you go through a different cycle, you get better and better and better. And if you could just improve one little piece, again, the other two automatically improve. Okay. Any questions on that before we hop into the next subject? All right. Let's talk about the IPOs. Um, let me talk about IPOs quite a bit. As you know, I did the webinar back in July. And it seems like after the webinar, the IPOs were sort of less than stellar for a while. But now it looks like they're beginning to improve. And I, I call it the Monty Python market, not dead yet. Okay. And that was my big fear that the bubble had burst in the IPOs. And there's still a quite a few there's still quite a few signs out there, and I hate to confuse the issue with facts, but as um Mr. Druckenmiller pointed out, a lot of these IPOs have no fundamentals, and to, to Mr. Druckenmiller, I, I say a big duh, because my webinar, the title of it was, The Promise of the Future, okay? Not the future, okay? The promise of the future, and that's why I went into the long diatribes on the trading of sardines versus the eating of the sardines. And I'm not going to bore you with that. Don't worry. But there's a few I'm not dead yet that are coming back to life. Okay. And one thing I'm beginning to observe is the demarcation is becoming better defined. Um, in the webinar, I talked about the die and the dies, meaning that an IPO comes out, it dies, and then it just keeps on dying. Okay. And then I talked about the flies and the dies as in several other patterns that, that occur, not just those two. But those are two, two of the probably main ones. The fly and die kind of looks like an upside-down V pattern. But the beauty is you can make a lot of money doing this fly phase, and you could even get in kind of early on a fly phase. But what's kind of interesting now is the demarcation is becoming better defined, meaning that they're either dying, okay, or they're flying, which is beautiful, and that's what we need. And this is Mr. Will Rogers right here. And he said, you want to buy stocks that go up. If they don't go up, don't buy them. Now, a lot of people have made fun of that, and that's brilliant advice if you really think about it. So you want to buy the IPOs or any stock for that matter that's going up. And if they don't go up, don't buy them. Um, I was telling a story just last night. The um, This college kid, friend of the family, wanted to uh, improve his grade in his class. And he wanted to, to kick butt in a stock contest. And so he was going to come over and spend a couple of hours with me. And a couple of hours became an hour. And finally, in 45 minutes, I'm like, where are you? And then he shows up. And as soon as he gets here, he goes, uh, i got to leave in like 15 minutes. I'm in between classes. So I'm like, okay, we're not going to be able to talk about pullbacks and entries 
and stops and trailing stops and widening trailing stops and volatility increasing over time and a lot of the things that we talked about today. So in my 15 minutes, and probably 10 of it was trying to find him a charting service uh, that he could afford, uh, meaning free, and getting him set up with that and showing him how to look at charts. And so those last five minutes, at that point, pressure's on, like, you know what, this is what you're going to do. You're going to only buy a stock if it's making new highs, okay? Now, I'm not saying run out and do this. I'm just saying what happened to illustrate a point. And the teacher told them that they didn't want them just buying some stocks, getting lucky and, and riding them out and making whatever. He wanted them to actually, tr actually trade. So at certain intervals, he was going to come in and say, trade, he or she. I don't know what the case may be. And I said, okay, fine. When you have to trade, when you're forced to make a trade, I want you to sell anything in your portfolio that's losing and keep anything that's winning. You could never sell a winner. Now, I know this may be a little flawed longer term without a complete methodology around it, but what happened next was interesting. He went from second to, I'm sorry, he went from fifth to last in the class to second in the class over a few weeks' time. Now, I don't know how it all ended, so I don't know. I'm trying to track him down and find out. It's not easier said than done. But the point is that he is only buying stocks that go up. And when they start going down and turn into a loser, he gets rid of them. And that, in and of itself, just by itself, was enough to make him successful, at least over that period of time. Now, I'm not saying that's all you could do, but in IPOs, the IPOs are the closest thing I have found to a Will Rogers stock, okay, meaning that you're going to have a lot of them just go down, and I call it the die and the die. And what's cool lately, now that the overall market is improving, is the demarcation between the good and the bad has been better defined. So I think the IPO market, again, to quote the Python boys, is not dead yet. Now, you will have to sharpshoot it versus shotgun. In a bubble, everything goes up, and it's easy, and you just put your money down, pick your money up, you just make a fortune, a la 1999. You will have to sharpshoot things a little bit more than shotgun. Like I said a few weeks back, when things were kind of getting iffy, iffy, you have to be a little bit more careful, a little bit more selective. And, again, this is what I'll always say. You're always going to have the fly and the die. You could always count on that. Now, you can't count on the number of the fly buys. Let me try it again. You can't always count on having a large number of flies and dies, but you will have some. There will be some euphoria about a stock, camera on a stick, uh, crazy chicken. You know, there's going to be some sort of euphoria, yoga clothes or something. And then the reality might just set in. But so what, okay? We're going to trade these stocks. We're not going to be with them forever unless, of course, we get the, the elusive, the fly and the fly, where they go up and then they just go up and go up and go up and go up. And that's the ultimate goal. But that doesn't happen very often. So this is just one example that I uh, pulled out real quick in the last few minutes. Just to show you, I mean, obviously we got Zen, which I just showed you. JD, early phases of breaking out, could turn into a huge winner. Zen's looking pretty good. We'll take a look at that in the portfolio in a few minutes. So, so far, so good on those. And, again, I just kind of wanted to show you one real quick in here right before um, we got things set up. But with a little breakout characteristic, you could have been in around 17 on this one. Because why? It was going up, Okay. It's kind of that Will Rogers kind of thing without giving away any uh, of the the, um, the things that we talked about, the specific methodology in the um, IPO webinar. Um, one thing that we've been talking about, my fear would be that IPO bubble would burst, and we talked about this slide quite a bit over the last couple of weeks. you got the market action, and you got the IPO action. In a bull market, everything works, including and especially IPOs. When the market begins to go sideways, it gets a little iffy. I have found sometimes you get this last gasp at IPOs. And then when the market begins to roll over in earnest, 
then the IPO market begins to fail along with it. This last gasp anomaly, I think it's caused by people scrutinizing companies more, putting them under a microscope, okay? And these are established companies which make up, like, let's say the S&P 500, or these Fortune 100 or Fortune 1000 companies. I guess it's Fortune 500 companies or whatever, just S&P 500, whatever these big companies are that are traded. They tend to put them on their microscope and look for the earnings and those fundamental things, those little pesky fundamental things that every now and then rear their ugly head. And they're because they become a little skeptical of these stocks, but for some reason, they're willing to part these traders or investors or whatever they they are. They're willing to part with a portion of their money and fritter it away into an IPO, and that's where you get that little last gas. Now let's take a look at what happened with the market. The market was here, let's say it was here, but now it's begun to go, begun to go back up. So this IPO market has had a blip up. So it's kind of interesting how this is unfolding where it's getting, hopefully, I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully we're getting back to this back here with the market and the IPOs and everything else goes up. Okay. Now, one thing I've been saying is there's still a few winners and all you need is one or two or a few. And the beauty of good money management with stock picking, okay, the combination of the two, like I said earlier, if your money management gets better, you're staying with that winner, and that helps you pick even more winners, okay? It all sort of works hand in hand. Now, let me show you the, the open portfolio, and here's the Zen right here, and you can see that's made a pretty good move in here. When you add everything up, you've got one loser in here, the Micron, but you add everything up, and you'll see that most of the heavy lifting it's just done by the two winners in here. So you can see what a difference it makes. In fact, three quarters or three fifths of the gain or just one position here. The partial profits taken on one plus the open profits taken on the rest. I present it this way to make the quote unquote education easier. So you can see, okay, we made this on this loaf, but then we made that on the remainder. And that helps you to see how important it is. And occasionally, and that's why I beat the dead horse on these outliers, because occasionally you can have one like this. Now, if you're asking why is this up here and not down here, down here is mechanical, okay? Up here is this, this, this is a discretionary trade I think was worth keeping in the portfolio. Um, Zen, for instance, Nick the stop, and it was you should have stayed with the position, okay? But then we got a re-entry on it, so I went ahead, I took the stop out, the stock out as a nick, and then I put it back in as a re-entry. So that's the mechanical thing. So with discretionary basis, you wouldn't have this Zen in here from 1665. It'd be in from um, much earlier than that. But anyway, I digress. The point I want to make here is that you just need a couple of these big winners, and this isn't this doesn't really jump out. It's not that huge. But it helps. It's over half of your portfolio, or just about half of your portfolio, in that one winner. Okay, so that's the importance of capturing an outlier. Okay. All right. Um, let's get a couple of announcements out of the way. I'm gonna jump into the market real quick, and it shouldn't take me too long to get through the markets. But if you guys want to start asking about individual stock questions, feel free to do so. So, uh, again, I've got the store on the website. Um, Volume one of these uh, of this of this year, we've had a pretty interesting year. We had an IPO bubble. We had a, a case period where we printed money, where we were unbelievably accurate, and then we had a drawdown. The market rolled over. The market faked out. All kinds of things have happened so far this year, which makes for a wonderful learning experience. And as I've been saying quite a bit, when I went to make this graphic. I couldn't believe how much stuff we covered, and it reached a point where I was like, okay, if I put any more on here, it's going to look messy, and you're not going to be able to read everything on here. So check those uh, out. Just go to store, and those are the weekend charts uh, or archives. I, to me, I just think they're they're cheap because there's a uh, cheap in price because, let's see, there's 30, 30 hours so far for this year, and if you get like a whole year, you get over 60 hours. So... If you love these, if you like these shows, you'll love them. If you don't like these shows, then I'm not sure why you're here. 
Uh, one one little thing, real quick. I won't go through all this. Don't worry. Uh, but the right now, I'm still running a special where if you get the stock selection webinar, you get to get a year to service, and then you get the IPO webinar free. And then there's three sessions left. Okay, there's three sessions left uh, with the IPO webinar. And what we do with that is we go in and we talk about IPOs, and then I sh then I go through the database and you know, I give you my database of IPOs. And then we go through those database looking for opportunities, and many of which you'll see come up in these um, wicked charts. Okay, all right. Let's uh, hop into the overall market, and then um, we could always come back if there's any any follow up questions on anything. Uh, I want to take a look at the P's real quick, and then I want to um, take a look at some sectors. Now I want to look at the micro in the P's and then we want to back that out to the macro. Okay. Um, if the S&P is closed where they are now, they're at all-time highs. Okay. So make no bones about it. That is a good thing. My only concern is it's got this V-shaped recovery at high levels. Okay. Now, if this market has been going down, you know, what about a V-shaped recovery at low levels? Well, yeah, if it's going down forever and it makes a V-shaped recovery, then longer term, it's oversold, okay? Shorter term, it's overbought, but it's so oversold longer term. There's pent-up short covering, um, so there's a lot going on. And that can help that market take off. But at high levels, it's longer term. This is just in case you're having a hard time wrapping your head around this. It's longer term oversold. I'm sorry, overbought. Because, I mean, look. Look at where it was way back here and look at where it is now, okay? You come a long way, baby. And so longer term, it's overbought. And shorter term, it's overbought, Okay. So that's the V shape recovery at high level. So it's hard to mount a leg on top of a leg. Now that's just technical analysis 101. Now, bigger picture and philosophically, which those two things, especially the philosophically part, can get you into a lot of trouble. But from a philosophical basis, one has to wonder if we do start banging out new highs, could we go off, go into a blow-off mode? And that's people who are into wave counting, which I strongly urge you not to do or attempt. But they would argue that sometimes you get these blow-off modes, and they do occur. 99 was a blow-off type of mode, okay, especially if we plot the NASDAQ. But you can see since 2009, this market's been in a pretty good run. And... In 2008, what happened? Everybody's like, F that. I'm never going to buy another stock in my life. Okay? And then the market starts making new highs, making new highs, making new highs, making new highs. And if we begin to accelerate higher in here, we could see a lot of people pile in for that last gas, that last blow-off type of move. Impossible to predict. I probably shouldn't even be talking about it, but I think it's plausible and I think that you have to keep that in the back of your mind. And if it does happen, we're going to be on it like a spider monkey, okay? And we're going to ride it out, and we're going to take a lot of longs, and we're going to take partial profits along the way. We're going to trail some stops, and hopefully we get stopped out of huge profits on a lot of positions, okay? So that's just one scenario. Now, when I talk about these scenarios, these plausible scenarios, keep in mind that I still look at the market day-to-day -day basis. I was doing this one years ago, and they were always like, bearish, 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 bearish. I'm like, what are you short? I'm not short anything. Well, why aren't you short? The market's going up. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty awesome. That, that's where I came up with the phrase, believe in what you see, not in what you believe. Okay. Steve says, the S&P is only in a 4% drawdown from a high. How much is enough to be a V from new high and not just a normal pullback? Well, 
you know me, I eyeball everything, okay? And Steve's point is that's only 4%. Uh, 4% is substantial in an index. And you got to realize that was 4% over what? How many days? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 days, 2 weeks. 4% in 2 weeks, right? That's a pretty big number, okay? Now, let's not get stupid, but that's 208% in a year, okay, if you were to analyze that out. Now, I know that's fun with math, but still, that's a pretty big run. And then you had one, two, three, four. Ooh, that Mountain Dew's kicking in. Let's, let's try again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Lo and behold, 10 days up from the bottom. Okay, which is a nice little symmetrical move. Some people believe in these symmetrical moves. So that's 10, that's 4% in 10 days. That's a big move. That's 208% a year annualized, okay? So I think that's enough to make a market overbought on a fairly shorter term basis. Longer term, and I've been encouraging guys to go in and do these studies, you know, see how long this market has lasted. And on a longer term, overbought too. Okay, so that makes it a little dangerous to just buy at this juncture. So well, what about that blow-off thing, Dave? That's fine. That might still happen. But we're not going to buy it here in anticipation of that blow-off move, okay? Like, what's his name? Justice Potter Smith. We'll know when we see it, okay? So let's say the market does break out decisively. Aha, we're in the blow-off mode. Then what we'll do is, on pullbacks, we'll look to enter the market, okay? And that's what we will do. Right now, a little overbought, a little dangerous to buy. Keep in mind now, methodology requires a pullback, and the market has done this. So a lot of stocks are going to look like that eventually, at least. So there's no pullback yet to trade in the long side, okay? Good point, though, Steve. How reliable are indexes? Some traders say is that the indexes are tradable. They lost the function to reflect real real state of the market thoughts. Yeah, um, you know, take a look at like the Qs. Um, is that the real market? I don't know. Is that Apple? Yeah. <laughs> and a couple of the stocks? Yeah. Um, but if you're looking at something unweighted like the Rusty, then I think you got something, okay? Rusty's down a little today. Okay, what are the P's doing? Or the spiders, however you want to look at it. Well, spiders are up. Okay, so if you just look at the spiders, you say, market's up. Yay, I'm going to tell all my friends. Well, the S&P is a weighted index. So is it really telling you what's going on in the market? Maybe the rusty's a little bit more what's going on in the market. Recovered from its lows, but still down nonetheless. So this is actually a down day in the market. And the... NAS, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the, the uh, Qs suggest it's an update, and so do the P. So, yeah, you might be on to something there, and that's why, which this is beautiful, because that's why I look at several thousand stocks every day, and that's why I like to um, look at two or three hundred, two or three hundred, about 240, 239 sectors and subsectors, and then some ETFs and some foreign exchange, uh, international indices, etc. NASDAQ slightly in the minus column. So far, a little breakout remains attack here. Um, it it kind of held up a lot better than the Rusty. It held up a lot better than Peas, for that matter, um, because it just sort of stayed range-bound in here. But so far, so good in the NASDAQ. A lot of areas are sort of looking like the market itself. For instance, like chemicals, you can see they were selling off out of a range, and now they're pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, and lo and behold, they're almost or at new highs. Semis, another area that's kind of doing that sort of thing. So uh, there's not a whole lot to really look at the sectors this week. Drugs, for instance, look like they were rolling over, made it back to new highs in here. Biotech looking pretty good there. It's been pulling back a little bit lately, but has broken out so, so far. So good there. So, again, a lot of sectors look like the overall market. Uh, like, take a look at telecom having a good day here. 
still looks kind of vulnerable, but if it keeps headed higher and higher and higher, then we want to avoid that market, and then it becomes new highs, and then we if it keeps hitting new highs, we start thinking about going long, okay? Hey, Dave, SPX round number 2000, what significance in, if any? Um, I don't know. Let's take a look at that. It's 1975. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I'm going to predict we hit 2,000. How's that? You know, we'll get all little stupid hats on. Remember the Dow 10,000 hats? Stupid, stupid, stupid. Uh, that might be the nail in the coffin, though, if they see everybody throwing around hats because of S&P 2,000. Um, it's plausible. I mean, come on, what's what's 10 points on uh that's like a Nats eyelash divided by uh, 1, 9, 9, 0. That's um, a 0.005% move, whatever that is. That's not much. Half a percent? Is that did my math right? Yeah, half percent move, if that much. Um, no big deal. So, yeah, it could happen. Um, is it going to be a magnet? Probably. But it's only 10 points. I mean, it's yeah, I, I wouldn't get too excited one way or the other on that. All right, uh, I'm not going to bore you and go through too many sectors. There's not a whole lot to gleam right now. Everything's in a bit of state of flux. Um, if the market goes on to bang out new highs, some of these sectors like the semis and chemicals and even telecom, they keep pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, are going to be at brand new highs too. And then if they can keep on keeping on pretty soon, we will end up with some pullbacks in those areas, and we will trade them. Steve, are you saying those are stocks in the? That's um. You want to look at all three of those, or are you want saying those are stocks in the index? Hey, Don's here, and guess what he wants to know about? Um, stock window is officially open, so if you guys want to talk about stocks, let's do that now. Individual stocks, your stock picks. Uh, I think Ford's in trouble still. You got a bow tie down; it's kind of crawling back up. Too many days on the pullback to trade. Um, but yeah, it's pulled back in here. I wouldn't short it, but if I had to go long or short, I would go short. Just joking about how Apple is NASDAQ. Yeah, Apple is the NASDAQ. I agree. And it's like every time Apple goes up, let's take a look at Apple. Every time Apple goes up, they, um, they split it. I was talking with somebody last night. He kept telling me Apple was 700. I tried to explain to him the split. I hope he doesn't. I hope he doesn't open up his newspaper and see Apple at 100. He's going he's gonna to ship his pants. <laughs> I kept trying to tell him, it's at 100 to split. Oh, no, it's at 700. I'm like, no, it's at 100 to split. It's at 700. I'm like, oh, shit. Pardon my French. Uh, James, let's not talk about that one, beginning with a D, because it's a IPO we're looking at, or I'm looking at at least. Uh, James, let's know about car. We'll take a look at car for James. Um, well, this is a case of confusing the issue with facts, right? I, it's like when budget or thrifty or one of these companies rallies, it's like, really? I mean, I, they just like, I don't get it. You know, they're renting cars, but I think, let me take a quick peek here. I think it forces me, this is one thing, and let me see if it makes a liar out of me. It's one thing it does, yeah, look at that, right there, car, look at that, see? That's one thing that managing a momentum list does, and I probably should do a whole webinar just on that, and the more I mess around with it, the more, I, the more important I think it is. You, you become your own little portfolio manager, and you learn how to run a big portfolio. It's kind of like a... For me, it's been a really fun game. I don't own all 100 of these stocks. I own some of them. Um, but it's been kind of fun, and it's been, great. it's been a great learning process. And it's like I would probably not rush out on a personal basis and buy Avis Budget Group because, come on, they're not splitting the atom. They're just renting cars. But what would Willie do? What would Will Rogers do? Well, he'd buy them because they're going up. So guess what? I bought them, so to speak, and put it in my momentum list, my Landry 100, okay? So 
as far as trading this one, had a nice little opening gap reversal yesterday. Um, this knockout move is not quite enough for me, but if it was a little bit bigger, I would say uh, kind of interesting in here. But I would pass for now, okay? Yeah, John, you figured it out. Good job. John figured out the one I'll talk about. Yeah, but you'll be able to buy more expensive pair of pants now. Yeah, yeah, see, I shipped my pants. Uh, <laughs> well, once he realizes, uh, yeah, I don't know. Apple's at 100. No, Apple's at 700. No, it's at 100. <laughs> they split. Steel stocks have been on a good run. What about AKS? What a little more pullback. Yeah, that steel stocks have had a bit of a fit and starts or starts and fits however you say it they they took off and then they came back in but uh yeah i agree and you had a pretty persistent trend here it wasn't much of a trend though i didn't like the way it kind of really didn't accelerate higher but then it kind of took off here um this one's not jumping out at me but oh look right there there it is landry 100 okay so i wonder how long this has been in here Oh, just for S and G's. Let me see. What's that? AKS. AKS. Twenty-three days. So it's been in a little bit over a month. Okay. Probably like right there, if memory serves. Um, it's not really jumping out at me, but I, I, I hear you. It's sort of in a longer-term trend. I guess you can kind of do this. It's been persistent. It did accelerate in recent times. It's pulling back a little bit. Maybe on a tiny bit more pullback, yes. Uh, it's not jumping out at me, though. If you're long, obviously stay long. Okay, FSI, for Andre, FSI. Um, well, it's waking up. It's got a big uh, amount of overhead supply above the market. Okay, it's got me a little bit of concerned, concern. Concern. Um, and it really didn't clear the prior little peak in here. Now it is only a buck sixty, and it is a it does have an HV of one sixty. I'm sorry, one forty six. Transposing my number for some reason. I would pass on that just because it's got bad memories. It's all over the place. It's dangerous. Okay. HQY TKO HQY. It's going to be an IPO. Um. My only problem with it is if we didn't have this wide range bar here, so it came public here and then it immediately imploded and then it took off, but it only got a little bit past its high here. And this was an example I used in the in the IPO follow up webinar. We have a breakout pattern and I I wasn't really crazy about this one because it seems like Twenty bucks a share is is kind of like the current. I'm not saying it's going to be the always, but it seems like at the current uh, level where if they come public twenty bucks or higher, you're you're buying of that first breakout type of move. Your your Will Rogers move uh, doesn't work out as well. So for me to get excited about this one, it would actually have to go on make new highs and then pull back. Now let's not confuse the issue with facts, but I'd also like to know what they do. Okay just to see if there's some sort of story, some sort of fad, or some sort of glory that they could um, do. Uh, this is kind of a wild and crazy one, and you can see I've got it marked up. I think I talked about it last week's webinar. I didn't like it because it's got overhead supply, but Howard, you were asking about this one, uh, or you're long this one. It, it, yeah, it looked good back here, but it had overhead supply. Haha, <laughs> David went through it. Well, it, it doesn't always work that way. And, and that's why, again, sometimes it's hard to do the right thing. And it's hard to watch that stock go by, but that's what you should do. Okay. Oh, thank you, Steve. He says, another great seminar. Fantastic. CEP. That's how you, that's how you get your stock picked. <laughs> CEP. Is that what you want? Oh, there it is. Um, thin, thin, thin. Okay. Really, really thin. 100,000 on average. Doesn't mean you can't trade it as a private trader. Just means to be careful. Okay. Uh, a little too wide and loose longer term. Let's see what happens. Maybe on a pullback, but this is a little wild and crazy one. So I'll say maybe on a pullback, Steve. But yeah, I like the way you think. I like the breakout. I, I think it looks good. 
Uh, wild and crazy longer term. Oh, you sold the fold. Okay, sold the fold. I shit my pants. I sold the fold. A C H N. He said apples at 100. Let me check the apple. Let me get my newspaper out. Ah, apples at 100. <laughs> um, somebody once told me it's like we were in a drawdown in the portfolio. You making funny jokes every week in the, in the presentation does not make up for the fact that we're losing money. I'm like, like, look, dude, I'm laughing to keep from crying. I mean, come on. This business is pretty serious. Um, you got some bad memories in this one. And then the other thing, too, is it trades in, it's, it's what I call a stock that trades in chunks. It makes like a quantum leap. And those type of trades, are, those type of stocks, I'm sorry, are just plain old hard to trade. So I would pass on that one, okay? Why do you not advise someone who don't don't know that Apple split to let someone else manage their money? Well, the problem is I don't know who would manage their money, okay? Um, I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. I don't want to say I don't know any good man, money managers because I do, but they are friends of mine, and what happens if they get in a drawdown or, or you know, I mean – there's one guy who I thought was legit turned out to be a criminal, you know? So it's like, and then I, I you know, without getting into, if you buy me a beer, some, you know, see me some, let's, uh, let's have a couple of beers at the bar one night. And, and I'll tell you some of these horror stories. Um, uh, so yeah, I hear you, <laughs> you know, but yeah, you should know that it, you should be say it's still 700. No, you can say it's 700 pre split, you know, that's fine. Um, yeah, I like that one. Uh, SC, okay. You got to find that that one is. It's, it's either in here or, or it'll be in tomorrow. Um, this is one. Let me see when that went in the Landry's list. I don't have the list 100% um, updated. Yeah, that went in on the 19th, but it's not. It's not in the list just yet. Uh, so that went in right here, and that was the biggest winner yesterday in the portfolio. Uh, the the Landry list, not the not the not the regular portfolio. I just liked it because it's breaking out. It's bottomed out here, okay? Um, it has that Phoenix look to it, rising from the ashes, maybe because it's a coal company. Maybe there's something to it. Um, but on a pullback, let it pull back. Now, what's the uh, – what's buy beware? What's, what's Latin for buy beware? Cavi, caveat? Cavi? I can't think of it. It's on the tip of my tongue. Somebody type it in, maybe if if you know it. Um, buyer beware! It's got an HV of 106. Yeah, caveat emptor. Is it caveat emptor or caveat emptor? Forget. It's it's. I, sometimes I get a little brain numb in here. <laughs> uh, but yeah, buyer beware. 106 HV. Okay, so that's kind of crazy. But on a pullback, yeah, it could work. Okay, just remember that it is kind of a crazy stock, okay? Don, yeah, we looked at that one for Don. Andre, R-I-O-M, R-I-O-M. See, it's interesting. Look how many of these stocks, there's R-I-M down here, right there, or in the, um, in the momentum list. That's kind of fun to look at. Yeah, and a little bit more pullback, that's a gold stock. Uh, gold stocks have been a pain in the butt this year. Uh, we made a little money in them early this year. Last time we went after, we didn't do so well. And now they're trying to come back again. So um, I have a love-hate relationship with gold stocks, this year at least. As um, my buddy Doug Newberry says, they're, uh, you love them, they hate your account. S-W-I-R for Mr. Gary. Uh, no. It's got to clear this prior peak decisively. Also, very overbought, kind of going straight up in here, okay? But if it does clear this peak decisively, maybe on a pullback, but it's kind of dangerous now. ACCO for Mr. Jonathan. Uh, maybe on a pullback. I mean, this thing is just kind of electrocardiogram up until now. I'm going to stop short of bringing out the EKG chart. But if you've been around, you know what it is. SLCA, 
Boy, that one's just crazy. I we didn't work. We tried that one earlier this year. Didn't work out. S L C A S C L A S C L A S L C A. There it is. Yeah, I think we tried shorting this one. Um, well, it's just kind of crawled back to its old highs in here. So it's going to have to break out decisively like that and then pull back before I get interested in it again. Okay. Look, it's in the, look, there it is right there. Here's a momentum list. Are you guys reading my momentum list and ask me about them? <laughs> Rick? Yeah, Rick's another gold stock uh, right here. All right, I got to hide this list. That's what y'all, y'all just, y'all cheating. Get your own, get your own momentum list. I'm just kidding. I'll give you a copy of it if you want. Shoot me an email. Um, yeah, this one kind of, it, it went kind of straight up in here. I think it's too dangerous now. It's kind of a little bit of that bottle rocket characteristic I've talked about every now and then where it just goes straight up. And then it get a little too dangerous to trade once you do that. Maybe find something else within the, um, um, he says uh, dollar up. Yeah, let's take a look at the euro short. Um, euro short in here, you can see, which is, believe it or not, I know you don't think I'm crazy, but it's right there. It's it's in the, the 100 momentum list. So what happened is when the market gets a little flaky, then I then I, I push out a little further to the ETFs for uh, to hold what I call a slot in here. But you can see euro down, which means dollar up. Yeah, euro's been in a... Uh, Downtrend, absolutely. WLK, WLK. I forget who asked because I hit. Uh, why are we talking? It looks like we talked about this one last. You must be long already. If you're long, stay long. Um, but it's need to, it needs to follow through. Look at that. It's also there. It is right there. You guys, let me hide the list. Y'all just looking at this and asking me about them. All right, which I'll give it to you tomorrow or today. The next week you could come ask me. Love, that's another one that's just kind of defying gravity. And, you know, I hate airlines. Well, if you know me, I hate airlines. Um, and stocks. I love to travel. Um, love the airline, hate the stock. Love the airline, love the stock. Look at that. There it is right there. Uh, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. Uh, why? Dave, you hate airlines. Why is it in your list? Well, because it's going up, you know. Believe in what you see, not in what you believe. GDX, that's going to be gold. The problem with, and, and I like the juniors a little better, I think the mother of all bottoms still in place here. It's kind of falling out of bed a little bit today, but notice it's just kind of going sideways in here. Back here, I'm guessing that's a bow tie. Bam, yeah, bow tie here, bow tie here. This was early in the year, remember? Hey, bottom and gold took off. And then, nope, top and gold. Bottom and gold again. GDXJ is a little bit cleaner. And I and I haven't taken it out of my 100 list yet, but like a good little technician, I will. I'll probably take it out before I show anybody the list because it's time for it to come out. You can see why. Well, it's lost momentum, okay? And then there's enough stocks that stocks that have momentum to uh, replace ARIA. That's going to be a a biotech stock. No, no, you got a big gap down. Um, no, no. Come on, Don. GPRE. We'll get we'll get Don over to the dark side one day of trend filling. Yeah, this looks kind of interesting. And look, there it is right there. Stop y'all reading this list. I know what y'all doing. Or y'all either that or you're good at finding momentum stocks. So congratulations. Yeah, I want a pullback, okay? Maybe on a pullback. Uh my only concern with some of these stocks have been in these long, 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 long trends. Okay, it went from four dollars to forty. What's that? Uh 40 divided by 4 is 10. That's a 1,000 percent. So it's it's going up over a 1,000 percent. I mean, what what are they? What kind of chemicals are they making? Are the chemicals like the greatest? Are they making meth out of the chemicals or something? You know, something that's got a big demand. Um, I don't know. Find, find out what kind of chemicals they're making. 
Well, it's looking like it's going up for quite a while. Transport tax is sideways since April. You would buy on a pullback. Well, transport sector is tricky. I don't. I'm not a big fan of transports to begin with. Okay, but looking, let's look. You know, I got to ask about the stock in and of itself. Okay, so if something's doing this, then I say buy in a pullback. Okay, close my eyes and buy. Close your eyes, and then buy. Close your eyes and buy. Close my eyes and buy. Okay. Uh, will I actually buy it? Probably not, because I hate airlines, okay? Uh, that's just a hang-up of mine. Because usually, usually, um, it seems like airlines, as soon as they get going, they turn around and go right back down. There's some jokes in there somewhere. Realize it after I said it. Uh, you see, transports have made it all the way back to new highs. So transports are sideways. Shorter term, they're going up. Okay, longer term, they're going up. So I wouldn't say transports are sideways. But mattresses are down. That'll take a while to sink in. What is Sealy? <laughs> Let's see if I'm right on that. Let's see. How do you spell Sealy? Oh, TPX. Well, matches. Well, they were down. <laughs> Long AMCF. That's going to be a Howard stock. Something to do with the 20-day moving average. 20-day moving average. Yeah, it's just too wide and loose for me, Howard. But hey, if it's working for you, um, knock yourself out. And then this huge gap up. That's kind of what I call a bottle rocket. A lot of times as you shoot up, come right back in. Fourth largest producer of ethanol. Oh, man. I, I hate those guys. I hate ethanol. Why is ethanol in our fuel? Is the government making people? They, they, they got it. It's got, it has to be government. That's uh, government doing that, right? Anybody know? Why is ethanol in our fuel? You know, I'm in the old cars. I have lawnmowers. Uh, it's just killing me, man. Carburetor manufacturers must uh, must have invented ethanol. <laughs> Government regs, is that what it is? That's horrible. Well, the farmers is stupid because farmers, it takes more diesel and energy to harvest it and grow it and chop it up. That's just making our food prices go higher. Why would you do that? Eat your food. Makes sense to burn your food. I Yes, that's not politically correct, Steve, so I can't say that, but I'm, I fully agree. False. What's false? False view. Well, Phil's, Phil's in the U.K. Hey, uh, Phil, I might be in London soon, so might have to um, get together for a stout or something. Um, FYI. Why is it false? Educate me. Beer. Oh, you got a beer waiting? Fantastic. Um, why is it false? Find a co-op and they sell gas without economic. Yeah, I've been, yeah, I've, I've got a, there's a, place I buy gas from, but it's, uh, I live out in the boonies, I live out in the middle of uh, East Jesus, so it's like, you know, it's not the end of the world, but you can see it from here, which I think is a Robin Williams quote, uh, pack a sandwich, you want to come visit, uh, all right, Phil, Phil, Phil says false, why is it false, Phil, not cheaper, and as someone said, you're burning food to get it, yeah, I agree, you're burning food, why would you do that? Uh, we don't have Crocs, but every now and then I'll hear, I, I, I swear to goodness, I'll hear, uh, I'll hear an alligator in the neighborhood. Now, there is a bird around here that sounds a lot like an alligator, which you'd be surprised. You'd think an alligator would be like, rawr, rawr. an alligator's like, meow, meow, meow. it's the craziest thing. <laughs> How'd you die? Well, I thought it was a frog, but it was turned out it was an alligator that ate me. Sub-industry, regional airlines is what I mean to say, meant to say. Oh, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, the regionals aren't doing so hot. Yeah, good point. Um, yeah, regional airlines are kind of crappy. You can see that they just kind of look like they rolled over, come back up. Um, if you really, really like a setup, my, my point is take it in and of itself and don't worry so much about the setup, okay? Um, for me, you know, you ask me about the stock or somebody asked me about the stock, it's going up. But when I picked it, when I pick it apart, I would say, okay, it's an airline. I'm not crazy about airlines. Not the best business in the world. Um, it's going up 300 percent. 
Uh, and, you know, so as I'm building my case, and then I go to regional airlines, like, well, wait a minute, it doesn't look so hot. Now, but Southwest really isn't that regional, if you think about it. I mean, so you can kind of pick it apart a little bit. What are the major airs doing? Yeah, well, look at the major airs. I mean, Southwest is regional, but it's not like um, regional, regional. So, oh, okay, I misunderstood, Phil. All right, okay, no problem. Until the alligator gets the bird. <laughs> yeah, I live out in the middle of the country. You're welcome, John. I appreciate that. Okay, John gets my point. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. You, you can kind of, if you want, if you really, really like a setup, then then take it, take it. Trust your gut. Trust your instinct. Okay. Every now and then I'm flipping through charts. I'm like, ooh, I like that. And then at that point, stop, stop. Write the stock down. Take it, take it, take it. Okay. If you like it. If you're if you're kind of on the fence on it, then okay. Well, let me check the sector. Let me think about this, and then kind of pick it apart a little bit. You're going to find your best setups, as I say over and over. They just kind of jump out at you, okay? Through the years, I'll have a stock jump out at me, and I know I'm going to make money. And people, my clients are like, well, why do you tell me? It's like, well, because sometimes I'm wrong, you know? And it could be, if I told you, you're going to rush out, you're going to put all your freaking money in it, and, um, you know, you'll wake up, and it's like the gentleman today looking at an apple. <laughs> All right, let's see if we get we can bang on a couple of them. JRJC, JRJC, JRJC. That's gonna be a solar stock. No, I'm sorry, China Internet. Yeah, it's waking up again. But look at that. That's just. I mean, come on. What are you gonna do? There's no structure that would have told you the stocks to go straight up. Okay, so there's nothing you can do there. That's pretty cool though. All right, Don, another Don, wants to know about TQNT. TQNT, we'll have to wrap it up in just a second. Oops, excuse me. Mountain Dew is biting me. Yeah, Don, it's um, other Don. Yeah, it's it's rallying, and it looks pretty good. It's sort of accelerating higher, but wait for a pullback on that before looking to, um, to get long, okay? You do not have crocodiles, but say Tammany cops and politicians scare me. <laughs> Yeah, Doc, I can't argue with you on that. Doc's local. Um, I agree with you on that, Doc. T-E-D-U. Yeah, I mean, who? Pfft. Louisiana, wow. I, I saw on I, those little, yeah, every now and then I'll go to Yahoo, and, and I'm a sucker for those headlines. And one of them was most corrupt cities in, um, <laughs> most corrupt cities in the United States, and they had our beloved mayor. Nagin up there, who's uh, he's going to the big house now. That's a shame. Uh, that's a not our local mayor, uh, the mayor of New Orleans. Um, I don't like the way this one broke out. It came back into its breakout range, so I would pass on that one. Let it break out, keep on breaking out, and look to play pullbacks along the way. What about the gaps in TQ and T? The gaps were worth the trend, right? T TQ and T gaps. I don't see no stinking gaps. Yeah, you got a gap here, but that's in the direction of the trend. Um, I wouldn't, like the days after it, I wouldn't be inclined to trade it. But it's sort of proven itself uh, by following through. I mean, that was 40% uh, ago, round numbers of just kind of eyeballing it. Um, yeah, I wouldn't worry about the gaps, okay? Chicago is 80%. It had to be, has to be Chicago. 80% of men go to jail. <laughs> really? Wow, 80%. Well, let me think about New Orleans. Our governor went to jail. <laughs> That's Louisiana. Uh, Nagy just went to jail. He's on his way to the big house. Okay, RFMD and TQNT merging. Okay, that's good to know. Okay. So, Triquint and RFMD. Yeah, they're going to look sort of the same in here. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay. Polish, Louisiana cities to be happiest. Baton Rouge, Lafayette, Alexander, can't remember the other ones. Oh, okay. Yeah, I used to live in Lafayette. Lafayette's fine. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and have to wrap things up a little bit. Um, I <laughs> All of Illinois' governors go to jail. 
Um, anyway, I, let me go ahead and wrap things up. I appreciate you guys taking time to, uh, out of your busy schedule to be here. Uh, as you can tell, I have a blast doing these, and I learn a lot in the process. So I, from a selfish standpoint, thank you so much. I'm humbled that you show up. Uh, anything unanswered, shoot me an email, David, Dave, Landry.com. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Sorry about the stocks we didn't get to. I had a little bit of a long lecture today, but uh, we'll, uh, I'll make sure I'll catch up on those uh, next week. And if you, if you need me to talk, uh, opine on one, just shoot me an individual email. I'll be happy to do that. Anyway, anyway, uh, everybody have a great weekend. We'll talk again, and I'll uh, see you next week, hopefully. Thank you so much.